Hi everyone in the world of cloud computing and welcome to the 11th episode of Cloud Computing Training Show with Brad Nelson, an internationally recognized and world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech, and AI. In this week's show, David and I will be talking about getting paid what you deserve in cloud computing. Hi Dave, great to see you and welcome back to another cloud computing training show all the way from sunny Texas. Yeah, all the way from sunny Texas, man, where the uh, or hats are big and so is the hair. Um, so I'm looking forward to talk about the skills that pays the bills. This is important. Yeah, absolutely. So how should you negotiate your salary given the data that we've received from Payscale recently? Is it too high or is it too low? What are your thoughts, Dave? I think it's medium data, so it's about average. And so if you live in uh, Silicon Valley or any of the major cities, even Melbourne and Sydney and you know some of the European city cent centers as well, you're going to get a bit more. Uh, however, you live in you know the middle of the United States or in any other rural area where the cost of living is a little lower, lot lower in some instances, you're going to get a bit less. And so this is a good kind of uh, way to look at, you know, how much you should get paid. So <clears throat> the best skill you can have is the ability to kind of find out what everybody else is getting paid when you go in and negotiate a salary. So these are helpful. You can go to Indeed.com. You can go to other um, sites and uh, look at what people are hiring, you know, cloud architects for people with perspective particular certifications such as AWS and Azure certifications and and look at the locations as well as what's being paid and also the type of job. I mean, this if this is a consulting job where you're traveling a great deal and you have to do client facing stuff and there's a little bit more pressure on you, you should be expected to pay a little bit more. Um, if there is a if it, this is a corporate job where you're going to the same thing every day and working in a cubicle, uh, you're, you're probably not going to get as much, but there's not as much stress in the job. And so you have to do a couple of things. Number one, figure out what your market is for the skills that you have. And, and this is something that people have a tendency not to do well. So I interview people all the time and they, you know, they're underselling themselves. And I, I think that you have to provide really kind of data to the your employer as to what people are making, why you're asking for this amount of money. And, you know, just like if you're buying a house with the comparables in the neighborhood and then also figure out which the uh, you know what uh, skills that are aligning to these positions and also what the job entails uh, and what kind of company it is and I mean everything just kind of factors into it the other thing if they're not willing to go up on the salary uh, phase and uh, ask for a signing bonus and they're given all the time so fifty thousand a hundred thousand uh, dollars uh, here, sometimes there's a uh, obligation to stay a year or two, um, perhaps negotiate college uh, training, you know, if you want to go back and get your master's degree, um, and also negotiate uh, additional certifications. So in other words, if they're hiring you because you have the AWS certifications that they need, you know, maybe you need 20 other you know, certifications over the next couple of years, and those are really kind of skills that are going to go in your pocket, and they should be able to increase your salary based on that. So it's a it's a negotiation, which is something that I think it's kind of funny. The people that are more talented out there seem to be the worst negotiators. Yet the people that are least talented out there seem to be the best negotiators, especially with the merit skill jobs. And and so you know, I I always um, like to talk to young people at conferences when I actually do you know, presentations about this is a career choice and recruiting or things like that and kind of get them excited about what they're worth and not necessarily excessively excited because they, they could overprice themselves out of the market, but just kind of, uh, you know, put the reality into is act actually how much money they can make. The other thing, I've been able to take a lot of, um, you know, friends, kids, believe it or not, that had jobs that didn't pay very well, you know, such as teacher and um, uh, other things that, you uh, you know, are, are definitely uh, good good skills to have, but they get families and they need additional money. And, uh, you know, get them cloud skills and basic cloud skills and get them into some entry-level jobs, not at these salaries, but he gets the foot in the door and they're able to kind of, you know, get in the career and make more money if that's going to be important to them. Anyway, you're a recruiter, so what's your take on this? What do you, what do you advise your folks to do? Well, that was a very subtle cue there, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yes, look, you know, I think there's a mindset around all of this. And like you say, you know, the more talent, the, the poorer the negotiation skills, that's true to a certain extent as well. And, and, and the, the, the mindset of their belief factors in themselves uh, denotes their self-worth, not only self-worth within the marketplace, but self-worth within their, you know, their whole life. Um, and that can stem back from historic events, et cetera, et cetera, growing up, college, university, relationships, all sorts. Um, so I think, you know, if you're looking at the sub-levels behind self-worth, mindset, what they're worth in the workplace uh, and how they work around their colleagues, I think there's a lot of, lot of layers that I look into and there's a bit of psychology that goes to that as well, as you can imagine. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll give a, a, a quick uh, story. Um, I was working with a, a candidate that, that came to me, um, was very interested in and very good at AI and, and he was you know, an awesome guy. I mean, what he was doing outside the workplace was fantastic with cryptocurrencies and um, uh, artificial intelligence and IBM and Watson and everything. I mean, it's just, you know, the list of things he was doing was fantastic. But he didn't, he, he had a different perception of how he was positioned within his company. And we did a couple of sessions which was really enlightening for him and, and really helped him. Uh, and I, I actually had about two or three positions lined up for him, for him to make a move. Uh, location wasn't great, etc. cetera, um, of, of his current employer. Anyway, I think it was a, a couple of weeks later, he came back to me and said, Brad, he goes, I'm really sorry, but this mindset shift has happened. My, I've gone back to my boss with a different mindset. They're now giving me a 25% pay increase as long as I stay with them. And I'm going to get more autonomy with being able to be working from home and it suits everything. And I thought, you know, that's a good, that's a good story. That's, that's, that's a feel good story. Okay. I've not you know necessarily made anything out of it in in respects of a commission but essentially his <laughs> life has moved on you know and, and that's that's good either way you know if you make out of it that's fine but you still make out of it from a factor that you've you've helped someone shift their mindset for that self-belief going forward that he's got now the that the he's empowered himself through different techniques that we used to go back to his current employer that he'd been working for for two or three years and the mindset the mindset shift enabled him to get the pay, pay increase that he needed and deserved uh, and not only that but get more autonomy as well and so he wasn't he'd cut down the travel problem that which was like you say a location issue is a lot of the the, the problems with the uh, you know getting the salary you require based on your location so he really got a win-win out of that and, and and i got sort of a a feel-good factor so i suppose it was a it was still a win for me as well but you know i think you're you're so i've gone off the beaten track with that story but I think it's really down to, you know, knowing the, the, the market worth of, the, of that position that you've got based on certifications, uh, based on your uh, experience, obviously, you know, focused on certain projects, you know, appreciating all of that, but equally being able to take a step back and say, well, you know, from a career growth point of view, is it worth me taking on a project that's going to give me these opportunities for slightly less money? Am I going to get more of a satisfaction out of it than rather going in at the top end of the market and just being a servant to the, the industry and just doing something that's, you know, to a certain degree, maybe just be boring because it doesn't actually push the, 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 the mind uh, or the, the capabilities of that individual, but they're getting paid, you know, 20 or 30,000 more. But they, it could almost look a bit stale in their, on their CV or stale in their, their mindset for their career, you know? Yeah, and I think those are decisions you have to make. And also remember that these, are, um, these positions are kind of like fruit. They get, <laughs> they get rotten after a while, and you have to move on to other things. So while Cloud Architect is hot now, in three or four years, we'll probably have a lot of Cloud Architects because people saw the inflection in the market and aligned their skills to that, that skill set. Solution Architect, DevOps things, it's, it's always going to change. And typically, the more you specialize in technology, cryptocurrency and AI machine learning, things like that, the, the more you're going to make, but also the more volatile that your pay scale is going to be because the, the market's going to kind of come and go. So cloud computing is a fairly easy bet because it's systemic and it's widely defined, probably ill-defined in lots of enterprises. And so it'll be around for the next 10 years uh, as we make the migration into the cloud, which is we're finding the global 2000 is, you know, not very fast. It's, it's taking us time to make it happen and people need smart people to make that happen. But if you get into, you know, something that, uh, is in, of interest to you, IOT, you know, blockchain, all the other cool things that are around these days, then those things aren't necessarily going to be, um, 
uh, around in two or three years. I'm sure the technology will be around, but they may not be, you know, that hard of a problem to solve and tool sets are going to be there. And so, yeah, I recommend people pick something that's typically general. It affects infrastructure. It affects IT as a general technology. And then something that's complex um, because you want to get into complex technology because other people are going to have a barrier to enter into it. And the less people that are in the market for that kind of technology, the more you're going to make. But you have to be happy with making that change. I mean, for me, it's it's easy. I always like challenging technology and learning about stuff. But for lots of people I meet in the space, and I was taken back at it at first. I mean, they're like, uh, I like technology, but I'm not in love with it. I'm happy to work with it eight hours a day, but I have a passion of doing something else, and I'm going to go ahead and work on that. And so they're in to get a make a de- decent living with their value and their passions in something else, and I think that's fine. Uh, you know, I like being having my passion in my job, uh, but not not everybody's the same. And and by the way, there's I've had lots of people like that work for me, and they're very successful. You know what they do. They're not ambitious um, per se, but they're successful at making things happen. And they're ambitious enough for their world. So it's it's always down to the individual, as you said. And you know, I guess uh, you know recruiters have to be psychiatrists uh, as well as uh, you know match people up with jobs. But the individuals need to be happy with where their jobs are going, or else it's going to be it's going to be fruitless. And one of the things I don't recommend is that you chase one of these jobs just for the high salary. Uh, because you're going to end up making a huge mistake then getting the wrong job. And, you know, as my father said, you can get paid a million dollars a year and still be underpaid if you have the wrong gig. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good very good saying, actually. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Your father was spot on with that one. And I'd just like to say as well, I think it's down there. It's The buck stops with the recruiter, if I'm honest, because we're, we're the kind of the gateway for the opportunity. And I think if we don't do our jobs properly or with a, a moral dignity behind speaking to the client and actually understanding what the outcome of the client is, what do they need the, the person to do uh, and, and, and how successful do that, does that person need to be, need to be doing that outcome? Um, you know, it's all very well having a skill set list and we've spoken before I think on a couple of shows about this. You know, anyone can have you know, certifications on every different things but you know, if, if the person um, hasn't got the experience or the hands-on of producing the output the client wants and, that, and then if we reverse engineer that, that's for the, that's for the recruiter or you know, whoever, mainly the recruiter, to dig into that, to fact find, to find out what are the outcomes that the client needs in order to make sure that we're giving or getting the right people in for that opportunity. And that sort of, it, it's systemic then from a, the, the right pay point to the right attitude to the right outcomes, performance, success of the candidate, et cetera, et cetera, quality of life, you know, happy, happy boss, happy employee and all that sort of thing. So it really is up to us, you know, recruiters in general, if, if there's many recruiters watching this, to fact find, ask better questions and actually find out what the output is required by the uh, person that you're going to be putting into that opportunity. And once you've got that, I think that's, that's the, the magical equation uh, because once you've got that and you've got the soft skills and the certifications and you know the outputs that's required by that role, uh, you've, you've got a far better opportunity to having a whole, you know, a successful, happy family at work. <laughs> I, I get a question. Do the, do the companies see eye to eye with you on that or are they just looking to fill jobs? Great question. Uh, I think it depends on the organization. Uh, and it depends on the volume and it depends on their time. Now, I always have the discussions, well, you know, do you see recruitment as an investment or a cost? Uh, and I always throw that into the mix as well because that's a very in, uh, pivotal conversation. Where you'll know, sorry, pivotal question at the point where you're talking to people about where they're coming in from, from a, um, a psychosocial point of view of bringing the right people into a team whether the soft skills are important or whether they're just looking at certifications, CVs and number crunching in that way. Uh, but you're looking at a higher turnover and once you ask the question, is it a cost or investment? Some businesses or some uh, employees or hiring managers look at things as just a cost, you know, keeping costs low but keeping a high turnover, which is just ridiculous. Um, because at the end of the day, it's going to cost the business more to you know, hire the wrong person. Uh, and more often than not, if you're hiring the wrong person, it's because the person you've put in did not know the outputs of what the company actually required. Uh, and more often than not, sometimes the hiring manager has not even been relayed that information either on what the outputs are of that particular role. So you have to dig deeper and maybe go to a line manager and find out what, what is it the line manager needs. 
Um, so it, it's it's not a comfortable conversation sometimes because people have an old mindset when it comes to employing people, um, mm-hmm. and and it, and it can be seen as an unnecessary. You're digging too deep. That's not, almost none of your goddamn business. <laughs> And it's like, well, sorry, excuse me. At this point, it is part of my business because you were having this dialogue, and it's it's just keeping it very transparent. Because why sh- why should there be anything that I'm not informed about when you know I'm being the gap between a, a very talented uh, cloud professional or you know fintech IoT AI professional that is, that wants to be represented by Nelson Hilliard and and bringing them into an organisation where I don't fully know what that person's going to be doing on a day to day basis from the line manager point of view. You know, it's great to have a relationship with the hiring manager, fantastic, our HR, HR department, but equally the, the dialogue should be transparent enough to have these conversations. And if they're not, then, you know, it's, it's, it can be a very tricky relationship to maintain when you're not, when you're, you're serving up quality people, you're putting people through, you know, various different interview techniques to find out, you know, really what makes them tick and what they enjoy doing. And then you're, you're teeing them up with something that you don't really know enough information about. You know, you're, you're really on the, on the side of getting a good hiding when it comes to, you know, upsetting people and, and, and upsetting people's lives. Because ultimately that's what we're doing. You know, that's, you know, recruitment consultants become very complacent with the fact that these, these are uh, huge responsibilities. Um, with regards to families and uh, and and how our decisions or how cho- our choices impact numerous people, not just you know a quick phone call to say you haven't got it or you've got it, you know this is this this is that. We really need to do the due diligence with the client and and ensure the client we've got their best interests at heart, but we need more information when it comes to the output of what that role actually means to the individual that has got the talents and the skills that we represent, you know. No, it sounds like you got a good beat on it, and hopefully uh, lots of the uh, companies in Australia have listened to this uh, video cast and will be the path to your door. I've learned a lot on this podcast, probably more than any other podcast we've, or video cast that we did. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, we'll I'm sure we'll be retweeting the arse off it, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like it or not, it's coming. David, thanks very much for being part of the training show this week, all the way from sunny Texas. Well, thanks for watching, everyone, and thanks to David for another great training show. And you can catch David on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. Uh, he's also on LinkedIn, and I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter as well, which is Brad Nelson on LinkedIn, and Twitter, which is Nelson underscore Hilliard. So thanks for watching, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe to the show so you don't miss out on our videos that we do each week. Thanks again for watching, everyone.